to this special Bradley Prizes edition of Conceived in Liberty, a Bradley Speaker Series. I'm Rick Graber, president of the Bradley Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us today. Our guest today is Nina Shea. Nina is a senior fellow of the Hudson Institute, where she directs the Center for Religious Freedom, which she founded. She's been a human rights lawyer for 40 years, working extensively for the advancement of religious freedom and appreciation for it in U.S. foreign policy. She was appointed seven times by the United States House of Representatives to serve on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and has served as a delegate to the United Nations main human rights body. Nina is also a 2023 Bradley Prize winner. Nina, congratulations and welcome. It is wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much, Rick. Uh, thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Uh, Nina, you've spent a whole career defending and advocating for religious freedom. Let's start with a very basic question. Why do you see it as a fundamental human right? Religious freedom, first of all, is one of our inalienable rights endowed by our creator, according to the Declaration of Independence, as, they are, as it's articulated there. And it's our first clause of our First Amendment. Um, and it's also part of our history, our tradition, and our laws. So, um, you know, we tend to take this for granted, but really when you look around the world, you see just how precious and special this right is here in the United States. Um, first of all, you know, we have uh, some people conflate freedom of religion with freedom of worship. And we have to understand it's more than just praying within the four walls of a house of worship within a church or a synagogue or temple. It's, uh, it's um, more than just holding beliefs in the secrecy of your heart. Even China has that. So what we're talking about um, is religious freedom as the right to educate your children and your faith and your values, moral values. Um, the right to manifest your beliefs in the public square, um, the right to change your religion or have no religion at all, um, the right not to be coerced, um, and, and, and many more um, factors as well. And this is part really of international covenants on religious freedom. So that's not just the American understanding, but we are unique here. Um, when I... Um, first began my career during the Cold War, I noticed in the, the Soviet empire that um, religions were the first um, institutions uh, and people of civil society that the regime uh, would target to repress. And they were the last ones standing in many cases, in most cases. And that's because I think religious freedom is really the innate search for truth and meaning, meaning in lives. And, and that's universal. And people are willing to uh, die and, and suffer for that. And I have been deeply impressed by the religious leaders around the world I have met who have shown such faithfulness and um, carried out good works under, under the most dire circumstances. Nina, you referenced uh the founding fathers and our, our founding documents. And without question, the founders viewed religious liberty as an essential right. The First Amendment to the Constitution clearly spells that out and reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Why do you think religious freedom is such an important element of what we call American exceptionalism? Well, you know, that wording of the First Amendment is really um, a, a limitation on government powers. Um, it, the, the government cannot, uh, by law, restrict religious freedom. And this is a very unique formulation of the right. Um, it means the law doesn't give the right, it guarantees the right of religious freedom. And just to give one example, uh, there's most countries in the world, including in the West, throughout the West, except for the United States, has a registration process. And this allows them to restrict religious groups or practices um, or to repress them um, and or to regulate them in some unfair way to discriminate against them. And um, 
it, let me give you a few examples here. Belgium has a registration process in which government officials can determine that uh, a particular religious group uh, does has no social value. And there are many groups that it just withholds registration for. France has um, a regulation that you uh, that bans religious practice and uh, cross necklaces, certain cross necklaces and uh, religious garb in the public square, in public places. It even goes so far as to uh, regulate how much um, is too much for Muslim women bathing suits on Riviera beaches. So um, then you, you know, India is another example where um, conversions are um, banned if they offer inducements, including spiritual inducements like inner peace. If they say that this uh, religion um, will offer inner peace, that's considered uh, an inducement and is banned. Of course, in undemocratic countries, it's even worse. It, it really, this kind of regulation um, blends into a full-blown repression. And, and Saudi Arabia is a perfect example where uh, only mosques are allowed. No, there are no churches and no other um, houses of worship that are registered um, as legal by the government. And um, even though there's millions of foreign workers who are Christian there, um, China is another example where the registered churches are then overseen by the Chinese Communist Party, and they determine the content of sermons, who can lead, who can enter a church. They exclude all children, anyone under 18 from churches now, and that's the registered ones. The others um, are, uh, you know, there's full-blown genocide against the Uyghur Muslims now. Uh, the Tibetans are, Buddhists are terribly repressed. And Falun Gong, which is considered and categorized as an evil cult under Chinese law um, is been uh, targeted for total eradication and uh, has suffered immensely. I lived in Brussels for a period of time and, and you just wouldn't think of Belgium as, as being a place where, where that goes on, but indeed it does. Nina, you've shed a great deal of light on the fact that religious freedom and free speech are under attack around the world and, and that includes here at home. Uh, what trends do you see around the world that could threaten how we view religious freedom here in the United States? Well, uh, Rick, freedom is threatened here in the United States. And um, just a couple of weeks ago, we heard about an, an FBI memo coming out of the Richmond office in which the analysts determined that um, Catholic groups who preferred the Latin mass were suspicious as hotbeds of terrorism. And, sh and he recommended that they should be monitored and um, uh, infiltrated. So, uh, you know, this is purely based on traditional preferences um, and uh, made no sense. And this is something that we found out about because the document, the memo was leaked and there was an uproar a public uproar, and it was then retracted. Thankfully, there was this uproar. But this is the kind of stuff that goes on in China. In fact, China is, is suspicious of all religion, and it's particularly suspicious of um, the Tibetan and Uyghur Muslim religions, and has um, not only high-tech surveillance all over the place, but has households in those regions spying on other households. And if they see religious um, practice that is too looks too devout they have to report to that to the police and that then you're liable for arrest and being taken off to a detention center for re-education this ramadan they have banned muslims from fasting so you could be reported to police if your neighbor spies you skipping a few meals uh so uh there is it's dangerous when our officials do not understand or care about religious freedom. I, I think of a senator uh, who um, disapproved of the traditional beliefs of a federal judge, um, then federal judge Amy Coney Barrett, and said to her, the dogma uh, uh, lives loudly within you. And um, this, despite the um, constitutional article that bans religious tests for religious office. Um, 
Anti-Semitism is another trend that has me very worried. We saw the unprecedented attacks against um, several synagogues. Some of the congregation were murdered in those attacks. Um, in those cases, the perpetrators have been app apprehended and are charged. Um, but this is um, uh, there. There is also anti-Semitism uh, rearing up in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, against Orthodox Jews who walk through their neighborhoods in religious garb and then are attacked um, for their faith. And this occurs with impunity. That means there's no arrest in most of the cases and um, no, no uh, charges. There's no accountability for this. And that reminds me of the, you know, the, something like the pogroms out of the old country. Um, it, we've also seen uh, massive attacks against 80 pro life. Um, centers in this country, um, scores of churches since May 2022, when the Roe v. Wade decision of the Supreme Court was leaked, um, that the decision on Roe v. Wade was leaked. Um, and again, most of those cases occurred with impunity. Um, when there was a press conference with the attorney general, he was asked, you know, why was there no prosecutions or arrests? And he he said something absolutely ludicrous, um, which was that because these assaults, these arson attacks against the pregnancy centers um, were occurring at night. Um, so this is um, really reminds me of, um, you know, I, I, of something that's, that Boko Haram would be doing that would be happening in northern Nigeria under uh, the terror group Boko Haram, where over 10,000 churches have been attacked, um, mostly with impunity, almost entirely with impunity. And, um, you know, you don't hear about it much because of their hate speech laws and blasphemy laws that restrict reporting. But um, you know, this is a sign of denial of religious freedom, undermining of uh, rule of law, and uh, frankly, of a failing state. Fortunately, of course, we're, we're not Nigeria. We do have uh, our free speech. Um, we do have our court system in which we can defend this right. Uh, Nina, you mentioned hate, hate speech laws. How do they impact religious freedom? Well, hate speech laws are found, uh, Rick, in most of the world, um, including in Europe and the West, but not in the United States. And what they do is punish um, offense, perceived offenses against certain groups. And in Europe, they started in um, full force after uh, uh, Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini issued a fatwa saying that that people should kill anyone associated with a, a novel that they uh, found blasphemous, that the Ayatollahs found blasphemous. Um, and this is this should happen anywhere in the world, including Europe. So Europe responded to this by adopting hate speech laws. And um, these are meant as a substitute basically for the blasphemy laws of Iran and Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, uh, milder punishments, of course. Um, but they've now been expanded to a range of other groups and to pr protect them from offense of speech. And there needs to be no other crime associated with it. Um, right now in Finland, a prominent politician who was a former cabinet minister is on trial for sharing a screenshot of the Old Testament. So literally in this case, you have Christian beliefs on trial. And in the UK, and we think of the UK as a bastion for free speech, um, I'm afraid it's not so anymore. There's a, a young woman on trial at this moment for um, praying silently um, on a sidewalk um, outside an abortion facility. And she was either in the buffer zone or right outside of the buffer zone, the censorship buffer zone for these abortion facilities. But these facilities could be um, 10 blocks long. And she was only praying. She didn't have any signage. She wasn't saying anything. This was a silent prayer inside her head. So I think that these are um, really troubling, uh, very troubling uh, incursions on religious freedom. Here, um, we're seeing uh, religious, traditional beliefs, pro-life beliefs, traditional religious beliefs on marriage or gender identity um, being called hate speech. 
Um, it shouldn't be considered Islamophobia when you defend um, uh, the Ahmadi Muslims, for example, in, in Pakistan against horrific persecution. But that also is included in, in hate speech in some quarters here. And so you have um, uh, elite universities, law schools, which is very frightening. Um, these are the future judges and, and a, a big tech, which functions at the pub, uh, as a public square, um, uh, canceling um, those uh, tagged with these labels and speech tagged with that label of hate speech. So um, I, I really am concerned that we are um, trending towards this European model. Well, let's turn to the, the difficult topic of China. Uh, Nina, you've been an outspoken critic of the Chinese Communist Party, and in particular, its repression of the church. You've also been very vocal about the plight of Cardinal Zen from Hong Kong. Cardinal has been punished by the Chinese Communist Party for calling attention to the abuses of the CCP. Another high-profile dissident case that you've had a lot to, to say and talk about has been that of Jimmy Lai who's been imprisoned for a pro-democracy newspaper in Hong Kong. You've also added your voice to others like Chen Guangcheng, who won a Bradley Prize last year. Uh, Guangcheng has called attention to the case of Gao Zhisheng, who was imprisoned by the CCP for human rights work and hasn't been seen since 2017. Tough question, but what should America's position be to China uh, moving forward, particularly in light of its unquestioned human rights abuses, its increasingly wider role on the global stage, and maybe most importantly, its global ambitions under the leadership of Xi Jinping. Yeah, I take um, really a page, I think we should take a page from the uh, Soviet Union and the, and the Cold War and what happened then. Nathan Sharansky, a Jewish refusenik in the Gulag heard about the uh, evil empire speech of President Reagan. And he was so elated that the leader of a the free world would speak out on uh, and uh, make moral judgment against his oppressor that he actually tapped on the pipes of his cell in Morse code to tell the prisoners in the punishment cells about it. And I think there's a great lesson in that for us. We have to start reaching out, building a relationship of trust with the Chinese people. We don't have that right now. All they hear is what their government wants them to hear. And it poisons uh, through its propaganda and censor censorship um, what the United States is all about and what it thinks about them and about freedom. And so I think that we really need to be um, uh, speaking about our president should use his bully pulpit, not other political leaders as well in the West and in our country should be speaking out on behalf of these dissidents, these political prisoners that you mentioned. Um, you know, I could mention many more. I'll mention one, and that's Bishop Jul uh, Julius Gia, who is in prison or is in a black jail, which is a secret detention for running an orphanage for disabled children without government permission. He had been doing it for 30 years, um, but he was taken away and has no due process whatsoever. People don't, his uh, parish doesn't even know where he is. Um, we should be really ramping up our public diplomacy um, with uh, uh, meeting with families, for example, and, and our broadcasting. And we should be scaling up um, the technology to break through the great wall of censorship of China. And we, we have technology, but it's not reaching everyone inside. Um, and again, I, you know, I think of, um, you know, we should be telling the truth, not propaganda, but telling the truth and, and, um, and, 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 and showing American values. Um, telling them the truth about what's happening inside their own country with a genocide uh, of forced sterilization and forced abortions against the Uyghur Muslim people um, and, and the rest of the repression. And I think of um, Lech Walesa, when he was president of Poland, he came to the United States and at a press conference was asked, um, did anyone in, in, in the Soviet Union listen to, in the Soviet empire, listen to um, Radio Free Europe, um, Radio Liberty? And his answer was absolutely powerful. Uh, he said, 
uh, can there be life without the sun? So I think that these historical examples that work to you know, really help bring down the Berlin Wall along with peace through strength, of course, um, without firing a shot, uh, should be replicated robustly on China. Couldn't agree more. We're in difficult uh, periods of time around the world, and it's definitely going to take leadership and American leadership uh, to be able to navigate these very difficult waters. I, I agree. And I think that it, it, it really... Um, uh, will hurt the legitimacy of the Chinese government when this is exposed among their own people because they don't know what's happening in their own country. The government doesn't want them to know. Nina, last question. What does it mean to you to win a Bradley Prize? Well, Rick, I am deeply honored and I am happily surprised. Um, I never expected it. Um, such a prestigious award. And I am really, you know, I'm enormously encouraged because Bradley is shining the spotlight on our precious First Amendment freedoms in this prize. And I think Americans, uh, as a result, will have a deeper knowledge and awareness of what religious freedom is and how unique um, it is here in this country and how they have to work to preserve it. And I really think that they will be inspired by the stories of some of the religious heroes and these situations around the world. So um, I really couldn't be more grateful. Thank you so very much. Well, thank you. And we look forward to the celebration. Nina Shea, thank you so much for being a leading voice, if not the leading voice on this very important topic of religious freedom here and around the world. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us on this episode of Conceived in Liberty.